Well, good morning. It is the 11 o'clock hour here on our Sunday morning, April the 24th. I lost my date there in the uh, previous uh, Sunday school hour there. But uh, it is the 24th. It is the last Sunday here of April. And uh, during these days and times where we live, we are not meeting in person because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, that is um, uh, taking its toll on some membership of our church. We've been fortunate all year long, not having many people to uh, contract and test positive for the COVID-19. But it uh, seems because of uh, just recent meetings and stuff that uh, it just kind of went through our church. It's taken a toll on many members. And we'll just <clears throat> make sure that we keep praying for them and just lift them up in prayer because uh, it's no picnic to be sick. Never is. And uh, some are getting it a little worse than others. We have some in the hospital, but we want to definitely make sure that we always pray for them. Now, we'll make this announcement here that uh, we will not meet again in person until May the 9th. Now that is Mother's Day. We always tell people to use caution and we'd love to have you, but if you are still not sure about it, then uh, <clears throat> uh, then you stay home, you watch online. Thank the Lord for those that uh, have put in the effort to make it possible for us to be able to, to be online. Uh, but tell people and, and share the good news. Jesus is still on the throne. We're, we're still going. And uh, we're here uh, during service times. If people need to want to stop by, and especially on Sunday morning, we uh, come and uh, make sure that we're here. And uh, we'll get the messages out and just trust the Lord that God will just work in people's hearts. Uh, so that'll be it. May the 9th. That's when we'll uh, come back again. Now, I don't say anything 100% for certain because things change quickly. They can change overnight. It's, it's done that around here just recently. So if we have to uh, <clears throat> take another week or whatever, we'll just do everything we can to be safe. And then uh, we'll stay in the Word of God uh, by means of electronic uh, online stuff there. I don't know what the wording would be there. Thank God for those that do have that kind of wisdom. I'm going to go over our prayer list here this morning, and we're going to jump right into the message. We just uh, gave the Sunday school message out, and then uh, <clears throat> about the book of Job. We'll expand a little bit on that this morning in another kind of message today. I'm going to encourage your heart, and uh, let's lift each other up in prayer. We've got several members that are in the hospital. Let's remember to pray for Bobette, for uh, Miss Yvonne, uh, <clears throat> Brother Stacy's home from the hospital. Let's pray for Miss um, Coleman, Diane Coleman, and uh, let's pray God give them some special, uh, special healing. Let's pray for these others on our list, and also all those that do have the COVID. Several people are suffering tremendously from this um, uh, Chinese virus, uh, and uh, they're doing it at home. Uh, but still, let's pray for them and uplift them. Let's pray for all our membership. Let's pray for Sue Smith, for Ida, that has Lou Gehrig's disease, for Vicki Hicks. Let's pray for Leanne Epp. Um, let's pray for Homer and Dorothy Chafin. My wife is continuing to get better, but it's just a slow process in her back. So if you would remember to pray for her, God give her strength. For Susan Madeline Parks, Chris Jordan. Let's pray for Sharona Newsom. Uh, let's pray for <clears throat> Ronnie Ratcliffe, Pud Holman, for Edie Glenn. This is Brother Martin's sister. They had to call in hospice for that. So for her, if you would remember this, Brandy Hunter, uh, for Doris Moorefield. Let's pray for souls. This is a good opportunity to tell people about the Lord uh, in these days and times. So let's pray for power for souls. Let's pray for many people that are traveling. Uh, for Robert Neely and Reba, let's pray for them. Bill and Karen, these are Yvonne's relatives and going through a tough time right now. Let's pray for each one of them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into our message this morning. And uh, boy, I believe God answers prayers. One of these days we're going to get to heaven and may not have answered it the way we wanted to, but he'll show us how he did answer it. So the Bible says pray about everything. Heavenly Father, I pray today. Again, as we come before thy throne, Lord, that you'd take this uh, prayer request that's on our list. Many of it uh, may have not uh, been mentioned. Many, uh, because we're a part, uh, we don't know about. But Lord, you know all about people's lives and the things and details involved in each one. 
We do ask, Lord, that you draw near to them. Give doctors wisdom in certain cases. Give healing to other body, uh, other people in their body. I pray, God, that you, your will would be done in the lives of all of this. Many times we don't understand all that goes on, but we do know this. You're in control. We'll speak on that this morning. You know that. And I pray, God, that you get all the honor and glory for that. So bless our time that we have here this morning uh, by way of online. And I pray, God, that you draw us close to you. Help us to focus our mind where it needs to be. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to be this morning in 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings chapter number 22. <clears throat> and uh, it's a little chilly and rainy outside this morning, so this heat kind of dries me out a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to preach this morning on this subject who's minding the store who is minding the store <clears throat> first kings chapter 22 <clears throat> here's what the bible said and they continued uh, three years without war between syria and israel it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Now here's, uh, the king of Israel was Ahab. That was the wicked side of the split nation of Israel. The king of Judah was Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, uh, he was a compromiser. He got with Ahab because Ahab told Jehoshaphat, hey, if we'll get together, we can go up here and, and defeat the Syrians here. So the Bible said, he said unto Jehoshaphat, wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat, he said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we might inquire of him? Huh, that's interesting to me, and I, oh, I'll get ahead of myself, but let me keep reading. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man... Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we inquire the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth prophes not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imla, and the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Zedekiah, the son of Chenaiah, made him, made him horns of ram, of iron, rather. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until ye have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. The messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. So they're trying to get this one man that always stands alone to go along with the crowd. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, uh, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he said, He answered him, Go, and prosper. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no masters. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou the word of the Lord. Uh, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now I'm going to come back to that story here in just a minute. But we're going to pray and jump right into this message this morning. Trust you'll listen to me. Uh, this is a, a timely message for this day. Heavenly Father, I pray you take these thoughts this morning. And I know my throat is a little dry today, but I pray, Lord, that you'd please help us to get this point across. 
May thy will be done. May the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May more than anything, we'll trust thee. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember several years ago, I was in the, uh, I think it was 11th grade of school, probably 12th grade, I don't remember, and those years kind of fuzzed together. Uh, I remember the teacher coming into the room, in the classroom, and got everybody, said, I want everybody to be quiet, just a minute. Got some news, this is national news. And uh, she said, stood up and said this, President Reagan has just been shot. Now, I was young. I was just a teenager. I'm not into much politics. I kept up with it just periodically, watching the news and not really getting into it too deeply or anything. And uh, when I got home, I just had to kind of, you know, find out what was going on. I had to turn on the news. I just wanted to catch up. It was interesting to me, national news like that, when everybody just kind of shuts down. I remember where I was when the Twin Towers got bombed by those uh, 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 Muslims, those uh, uh, <clears throat> ungodly religion of Islam there. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I, I remember that. But I remember uh, going home and hearing uh, about President Reagan being shot. And I remember this as vividly as it was to, to, today. When President Reagan was lying on a stretcher, now this was a reporter giving the story there, he saw all his cabinet was around him. Many of his top people, they were all gathered around him. And here's what President Reagan said. He was shot, laying on a gurney, going into surgery, and he said this, If you're all here, who's minding the store? And I kind of smiled a little bit. Of course, he was the great communicator. And I thought to myself, boy, what a thought that that is. And I've thought about it many, many times over. When things are around us, they kind of look like nobody's running the store. You watch the news this week and killing after killing, chaos after chaos, riot after riot. People seeing justice upside down and seeing some justice is good. Someone said that America is just turning into an insane asylum that's run by all the inmates. And I've heard many side comments about how things that are going on, and they'll say things like this, it can't go on forever. And I wonder, who's minding the store? All this stuff that's going on, who's minding the store? I imagine the Hebrews down there in Egypt, they thought it would never, never, never end. 400 years is a long time to cry out to God and nothing seems to be happening. Now we know it's all started out pleasant enough and when Pharaoh knew, the Bible says this, when a new Pharaoh came on that knew not Joseph, things started turning murderous, even dangerous to even live. The children of Israel were losing their lives. Babies were being thrown to the crocodiles in the river and slain with the sword. Hebrew lives were under attack after that for many, many centuries. And the Bible said this, they cried. By reason of the taskmasters. Let me say 400 years is a long time. 400 years. Is God listening? Where's God? Does the God of our fathers even hear us? But I assure you Exodus 3, 7 said this. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. You know Noah endured the garbage of his day for 120 years. Oh, it's, the Bible says this, his days were just like our days. He's seen violence. He's seen protests. He's seen homosexuals. He's seen uh, perverts. He's seen injustices done. He's seen God's name taken in vain. He's seen uh, drunkenness and riots, fornication, uh, lasciviousness, all those things there. I imagine he said, well, all this stuff's going on. And he did it for 120 years. He had to do it. No doubt he thought to myself, who in the world is minding the store? As we look around us and see, and even farther than that, we even feel the curses of this age. Many of our people are sick and many have suffered. We ask ourselves this question, what in the world's going on? Who's minding the store? Anybody in charge? Anything ever going to happen? Any? How, how can senseless killing and violence just keep going on. I read yesterday in Ohio, two 13-year-olds, two one 
stabbed another one to death. Another one was getting ready to stab somebody to death and an officer had to intervene and that person with the knife was killed because the officer had to stop her from killing somebody else. We wonder how in the world can all that senselessness. I listen to stories sometimes of people and they'll tell me about how they went through a tough time in their life and the atrocities and the uh, uh, reproaches that they had to go through and they kept it hid inside and they kept it under wraps for years and years and years. Some of them got saved, some of them got help, but many of them still hold on to it and hide. No doubt in their mind, who's minding the store? How in the world can such things keep going on? We look around us today and say, how in the world can diseases ravage this world? This is a modern day. We've got modern medicine. How in the world can one little germ nobody see take over? How can criminals keep getting away with breaking the law and those that work hard and obey the law have to keep paying for it? Who's minding the store? Let me say this, Christians are immune from the consequences of the penalty of sin, but it doesn't mean we're immune from the curses that is around us in this world. One preacher, I think one author, he said it like this, we may be saved from this world, but it doesn't mean we're safe while we're in this world. Now let's go back to our text in 2 Kings chapter number 22, verse 1 through 28 here. I read you the majority of this story, but here's Ahab and Jehoshaphat. They were going to battle together. Now Ahab was wicked and vile. Ahab, by the way, was under the judgment sentence of God. God had promised that the dogs were going to lick his blood by the atrocity and murder that he did with Naboth uh, some 20 years earlier. I mean, it's three three years earlier. Jezebel didn't get uh, her judgment until 20 years later there. But Ahab was vile and he's wicked (coughs) and he knew not God. Jehoshaphat was no more than a compromiser. He had known of God, but he formed this alliance with Ahab. Now Jehoshaphat wanted to hear from the Lord before they went to battle. Let's get everybody in here, all the uh, prophets, and let's find out what it's going to be like if we go to battle. Will they give us good news or bad news? So 400 prophets come in. And I thought to myself, uh, 400. Somebody really wants some assurance. So these prophets, all 400, you got to get this, all 400 of them, they said, hey, it's okay. Go on to battle. God is going to prosper you. And one of those prophets even had a sermon illustration. He got two horns of iron, the Bible said, and he probably played like a bull running back and forth. And he says, hey, here's what's going to happen. With, the, with these, you're going to push back the enemy. Oh, everybody clap. Oh, what an illustration right there. Here's the interesting thing. Jehoshaphat wasn't totally satisfied. So he asked if there were any more that could prophesy. I got news for you, friend. That's a sorry testimony. If 400 people, 400 prophets can be so unified... And still not be trusted. You said, but then that's a, that was just a crazy day. That's in our day. People are trusting this liberal media that spreads all kinds of lies about truth and what's really going on in this world. And people are swallowing a hook, line, and sinker. And it's a few people standing up and saying, hey, let's get another word about this. Why? Because they can't be trusted. My friend, listen. Uh, if you... If you believe everything that you hear on that local liberal news and all, you, you, you need your head examined. Peter Jennings, he was on the liberal network, but he did say this, and I like this. He said, if you hear your mother loves you, check it out. Just make sure. Hey, friend, I got news for you. Just make sure. Make sure the news that you hear, don't, don't just swallow it hook, line, and sinker. So here's 400 prophets. By the way, they were so unified. They still could not be trusted. But here's what Josh Fad said. Can I find one more? Ahab said this. Yeah, there's one more. Named Micaiah. But I hate him. He never says anything good to me. So here's what the Bible said. They went and got Micaiah. They brought him back. The servant that went and got Micaiah. He said, now listen, Micaiah. I know you're a prophet. I know that you know you, you uh, tell what the Lord says. But there's 400 prophets in that room. And they said one thing. And you need to go along with them. 
Micaiah, the, Micaiah, he said, listen, whatever the Lord tells me to do, I'm going to do it. But when he got there, here's what the Bible said. Now, this is, this is where it gets interesting. When he got there, Micaiah told them exactly what they wanted to hear. Yeah, go ahead. Lord of props be there. Abraham, or Ahab, rather, he couldn't believe it. Of course, uh, Micaiah, he starts saying this, and then Ahab stands up and says, hey, you always prophesy evil against me. But Micaiah wasn't finished. And here's what the Bible said. He told Ahab and Jehoshaphat and all the people. He said, Israel's got no leadership. The king's going to go out, but the king's not coming back. And then he goes, and here's, my, here's the part of the whole message right here. Micaiah goes to an interesting story about a vision that he had. Verse number 19, he said there was a time in heaven when the Lord was sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven gathered around him. And with all this host and this thing going on in heaven, here's what God asked all that host of heaven. He said, who shall persuade Ahab that he, he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Now this is all in the text right there. One of the hosts there, one of the angels, the Bible calls him a spirit, said this, I will persuade him. And God says to that host in, the, in this heaven gathering, how? This host says this, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And God said, go forth and do so. Now, Micaiah told them, that it was a lying spirit in the voice of 400 prophets. I can imagine all of them just rolling back. Oh, come on, Micaiah. Ah, listen, you always uh, kind of have to stand alone. You're just an attention getter. So they mocked him. One guy went up to him and just slapped him across the face there. Micaiah, watch this now. He said this. They mocked Micaiah. I said, the king's not coming back. And Micaiah said, because all those prophets, they've got a lying spirit. That lying spirit is sent from the throne room of heaven. Ahab said, lock him up until I come back. Micaiah, he was in a predicament then because he knew Ahab wasn't coming back. He had heard from God. One would think the 400 prophets that agreed on one goal and one piece of advice that they could be trusted. But wait a minute, wait a minute. It was a whole generation of people in Genesis chapter number 11 that said, let's build a tower to heaven. Surely everybody trusted all the word of all those people that were unified. We could trust everybody that was in that uh, generation there. We could trust 400 prophets. But wait a minute. You better check with God. You better check with God. God may have sent a lying spirit. Among. Now I'm going to come go somewhere with this because this is so interesting. God is the final authority and God is the truth. It doesn't matter how many people uh, have an opinion that's unified with everybody else. It doesn't matter how many people go against God. You better trust God's word. Majority rule, my friend, is dangerous. That's why we are in the situation we are in in our country today and in this world today. This world has unified and said things that are wrong and against God and said they're okay and we're going to go along with it and people follow along and just because a bunch of people said it they, and it was against God, they went along with it because of majority. You know what the Bible said? Let God be true. Every man. A liar. Doesn't matter what Supreme Court says about marriage. God is more supreme when He says it was man and woman that are to marry. Doesn't matter what billboards, commercials, sports, government laws say about liquor. God says liquor is wrong. Doesn't matter what education says about the origin of this world. God said He created it, He holds it together, and it all belongs to Him. I'll tell you why we're in our mess today. I'll tell you why this world's falling apart. I'll tell you why there's violence. I'll tell you why there's disease. We have trusted the majority instead of God. The Bible says don't ever follow a multitude to do evil. 
Throughout the Bible, God gives us insights into the realm of headquarters, my friend, that rules and reigns over this world. There is something bigger going on than just the little dramas that we're often consumed with. We get consumed with the crowd in a little thing and all the violence that takes part. Wait a minute. Sometimes you say, well, you know, that's, it's because of this one rules and this one rules. No, let me say this. It's because God is ruling. It's because God, is, God will allow things, my friend. He, watch this. The Bible gives us this glimpse into heaven. He's surrounded by a host of angels that do his bidding. Those angels are both faithful and fallen angels. Now watch this. In our opening story, the host of heaven is gathered around that throne. God asks a question. God asks a question. But he doesn't ask that question because he needs an answer. Why? God already knows every answer. There's not a thing God doesn't know. Listen, Proverbs 30, uh, 21, 30 says this, There's no wisdom nor understanding nor counsel against the Lord. When God asks man a question, it's not for an answer. It's for a confession. You see, man must admit to himself what is truth. In the Garden of Eden, Adam, where art thou? God already knew where Adam was. God knows where you are. God's seeking you today. If you're away from Him, you're not uh, in His fellowship, you're not saved. God is saying, hey, sinner, where art thou? Hey, backslidden Christian, where art thou? God already knows where you're at. He already knows where you're at. He just wants that confession. That's why He came to Paul, Acts chapter number 9. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? God knew why Saul persecuted him. He was full of hate and evil and sin and needed to be saved. He already knew the answer. Before man can ever accept truth, though, he must see the falsehood of his ways. That's why God comes to man asking him a question, not to get an answer, but to get a confession. Now watch this. The Bible gives us a few illustrations that when God <coughs> asks a question in the host of heaven... It's not to get any kind of counsel or ideas. When God had these angels around him and said, How is it that I can persuade Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead? He didn't ask him for counsel. God knew what he was going to do. When God, in Job chapter number 1, we saw this in Sunday school. When Satan came before God, he asked uh, Satan a question. Hast thou considered my servant Job? It wasn't. So God could get counsel. It wasn't because God needed any kind of ideas. It was to teach us something. Us that are living here on this world. Us in this world. The us that are living in these times when it seems like everything is falling apart. Listen, God knows His plan. But He wants us that are saved and mankind that will turn to Him that that plan of working is given to us for our learning. God wants us to know some things. Sometimes it's very strange to us. You know, as I go through the Bible, this bothered me many years ago until you really accept the fact that God's in 100% uh, authority over the good and over the evil. There are passages in the Bible that say things like this, an evil spirit from the Lord. That doesn't mean God is evil. But there are times God will use evil angels and allow them to do their work so His will can come to pass. That's where we are in this, what I call, plandemic. And I, it's not original with me. I've heard it of. It is a plandemic. Wait a minute, Brother Dean, that's a Chinese. They ain't done all that. I got bigger news than that. Maybe God planned it. Hello? Maybe God planned it. But people are dying. Wait a minute. Now God holds life in his hand. We got to get out of our small mentality and think on a higher plane. Watch this now. Psalm 78 tells us how the children of Israel provoked the Holy One of Israel. 
And the Bible said they turned their back on him. Hebrew calls it this. The day of provocation. There was a time when the, they crossed the line so far. Making God so angry. Here's what the Bible said God did. God did. Psalm 78, 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble. By sending evil angels among them. You mean, brother, didn't God send evil angels? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Let me say this. Who's minding the store? God's minding the store. We don't understand everything that's going on. We look around and say, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And that's the New Testament prayer that we ought to be praying. Jesus ought to come quickly. Yes, Jesus, uh, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. But let me take you to a command center. Another command center. Go with me, if you would, in your imagination just a minute to an unseen yet real world. A real world. And the Bible gives us this, this glimpse of it. And it's for our learning. It's not because God needs to know anything or needs ideas or has a counsel. God needs no counsel. I say again. But God's on the throne. He's in this throne room in heaven. He's the creator. And at present, the Bible said he's the sustainer of all things. Well, I can't imagine the great wisdom and power that God has. But I will give you this. The Bible said, Psalm 48, 47, 8. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Isaiah said, Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Remember the Ezekiel? He saw those visions of wheels. You see, when Ezekiel saw the wheels of consequences... That's what I call them. The wheels of consequences. They were turning within and they were turning without. A wheel within a wheel. You know what those wheels always represented? The cycle of events that happen when we choose a decision. Sometimes we choose to leave God out. Sometimes we choose to follow God. You see, the choices we make, the choices this world has made, will turn and lead to other choices, and that will turn more consequences. It's a cycle that will never end until men and nations and families and churches get off the merry-go-round and turn to God. Why are we in this situation that we're in and people are panicking? Christians are losing their faith in God. I got news for you, friend. This whole cycle is because we've left God out of our nation. We've turned our back on God. It's interesting that the vision of Ezekiel, uh, that above the wheels was a throne. You can read it in Ezekiel chapter number 1. He, God was above all the cycles that man has caused for himself. When the throne rose, the Bible said the wheels were lifted up. Even though man was reaping uh, the consequences of his decision, God was still in charge. Now let's go back to the throne of heaven here for just a minute. Gathered around him are all those created beings. There are worshiping angels, those that have not left their first estate. And then there are angels that present themselves before God for accountability and accusation because they did leave their first estate. Job chapter 1 uh, and 2 tells us this, that Satan himself, he has to come before God. Satan, of course, tells the Lord that he has been walking to and fro in the earth. The Bible says that in First Peter, he's a roaring lion. This has always been the modus operandi throughout all time. Satan is just looking to destroy the method of how things work. Satan is the accuser of the brethren and the destroyer. But it can only work ah, like this. On a leash. You say, well, what does that teach us? That teaches us this. That God is on the throne. God is on the the throne. Satan can only do what God allowed him to do. One day God will bind him up, throw him in the bottomless pit. But until then, Satan is still on a leash. And God may allow him to do things. And it's above. It's above sometimes. The way that we think. But boy, let me say this. God's mind in the store. 
Here's what the Bible says. Don't fear him who can destroy your body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's God. That's God. During the tribulation, Revelation chapter number 12, this is interesting. The Bible says there will come a time when Satan will no longer present himself before God. That will be when God will unleash the devil because he will be cast out into the earth for a short time to unleash all his terror and his fury. That will be the last three and a half years of the tribulation. You can read that in Revelation chapter number 12. He will then tell the earth, this is what Satan will do, that he is God. He'll think he is because he's not on a leash anymore. He'll think he is God. This will be a time that he knows is short. And the Bible says he's going to have great wrath. Now with all this in mind, we wonder as we look around today, who is minding the store? We think, well, President Biden can't do it. No, he can't even string a good sentence together. I don't think his IQ is much higher than his shoe size. He, listen, when people voted for him, they didn't vote for him. They voted for a system. Same thing with any of them other idiots they voted. They don't know how to run their own business, let alone anybody else's. With all this in mind, who's minding the store? Well, in America, we know it's not the president anymore. Uh, in this world, we know it's not other great leaders. They can't even uh, have any kind of peace and satisfaction in their own country. I say with the authority of the Bible, my friend, on this April 24th, 2021, when it looks like everything is falling apart, that God has never abdicated his throne for one second. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's never taken a break. He's not going to take a break. And all this that we see going on, we may not understand it, but God allowed it to happen. The events of this world, with all its chaos and confusion, is planned and allowed by God Himself. God, I assure you, if, that, if, if this Bible is true, and it is, it is uh, down through eternity true, and, will, and the, the world will pass away before this Bible passes away. But let me say this on the authority of this Bible. God's mind in the store. God knows what's going on. What does that mean? That means if we lost everything like Job did, we can still hang on to God because God's hanging on to us. Especially if we're saved. You're not saved. Friend, you better run to God. You better run to God. All it, if we lost everything in our personal life, God is still on the throne. If this whole world became sick, bedridden, derelict, and down, all God is still on the throne. This world could take a different direction if we'd just turn to God, but man in his pride and his, and his arrogance would rather suffer than deny his own pleasure. Ten times Moses came before Pharaoh said, let my people go. Nine times Pharaoh said no to God. That's telling me that Pharaoh would rather sleep with the frogs. Pharaoh would rather scratch from the lice. He'd rather watch the cattle die. he better thirst from no water. he better have fiery hell rain down. He'd rather lose the firstborn of every, uh, uh, of every house in the nation of Egypt. He'd rather do that than say yes to God. Why are we so stubborn? Why are we so stubborn? What benefit is there to turn from God that uh, to, to turn from the God that holds it all together and could prosper it again if we just turn to Him? Boy, I tell you what, all those who listen to my voice, especially those members, Landmark Baptist Church, you want to have a piece of sunshine in a nation that's corrupt and dying and going to hell? Oh, make sure we walk with God. Hold God's hand. Turn our heart to Him. Make sure we pull our heart out to Him. Why? I'll tell you, in the midst of a stormy nation, God can shine a little ray of light in our area. It's our responsibility. Oh, bright in the corner where we are. God knows what, he, what He's doing. Looks like it's all falling apart. You know why? Because it is. Because it is. You mean God's letting it, uh, God's just breaking apart? No, God's not breaking apart. God is always together. God is allowing this world to decay to show us something. Show us His preeminence. He, I always wonder though, will it goes so far as the way we have nothing left. 
Well, the Bible teaches us some basic things there. God's allowing us to show us without his preeminence, we will have nothing left. So from the standpoint of a Christian, let me say this. God's on his throne. And when we can only see the bad, God's still on his throne. Look beyond the physical realm. See the peace and glory of God's throne room. There's no disease around heaven. There's a big green rainbow. There's no disease there. There's no chaos there. Everybody's worshiping God. There's no wickedness there. No evil ever enters. Nothing that defileth will ever get in there. There's only peace and praise and glory where God rules from and sets in order all the events. You know where it's all coming to? It's going to end in that throne room one day. Oh, everything on this earth, God's allowing it to fall apart. He's turned the evil angels loose. He's turned diseases loose. He's turned things loose. And God's allowing it to do. Mankind, look up. Mankind, look up. Sinner man, if you've ever been saved, look up. Hey, turn to God. Job went through the worst suffering that an individual could go through. But here's the interesting thing. Everything Job went through was planned by God. It was God that brought up Job's name to Satan. Did you ever think of that? Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? But it was that same God that knew Job would remain true. Job suffered in his body, but his soul looked beyond the immediate and saw the eternal weight of God's glory. I say that God's mind in the storm because he's on the everlasting throne. God was on the throne when Adam and Eve sinned. God was on the throne when the world was underwater and only eight people on a boat. God was on the throne when Satan tried to rise against him. God will never leave that throne. God's on the throne and in control of everything when it looks like all is falling apart. God is on the throne. Let me give you three things here or two or three things and then uh, three things and I'll be done. Number one, God will only let evil working Go on for so long. In his time and by his schedule. We're going out of this world. This world's not going to last. And when it's all said and done. In his time by his schedule. He's going to take care of things. There are times in the Bible. When things got to a point of no return. You know what God did? He sent messengers. He sent messengers. Listen to this old preacher this morning. God sends messengers. Uh, but people would not listen. It was then. God stepped in, and in mighty power, he cleaned the slate. He cleaned the slate. God's coming. Jesus is coming. That day is coming. You better trust him. Let me say this. Here's an interesting thought. I, this is encouraging for some of us, especially those of us that have lost loved ones. Isaiah 57, verse number 1. It tells us a great promise for those that have already gone the way of death, and that we will be delivered before it gets to that point of no return. Listen to what the Bible says. Psalm 57, 1. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Boy, when I read that, sometimes we've buried loved ones. I buried my mother and my father. We've buried loved ones. And we couldn't understand why. They, weren't, they were older, but they weren't that old. This verse tells us that God is sparing them what he saw coming. Oh, what a, oh, what a verse that is. Watch this. Let me say that again. You know, God takes some people out of this world, some of his children, because he knows what's coming. And he's going to spare them from what's coming. Oh, what a great God that that is. It may have been something that's coming in the world as a whole. But God may have saw something coming in their individual state. Maybe he saw more pain and he didn't want them to go through it. Maybe he saw more tragedy. He didn't want them to go through it. God knows this. God knows. And sometimes God will step in and take a person out. Uh, to spare them from the evil to come. Let me say number two. God knows the sufferings his children are going to go through. God's not blind or deaf or dumb. I say this. Walk with God in your soul through the turmoils of this life. As Job poured out his heart to God. 
look to the throne of the same throne room of heaven where God is. Let me say number three. Live in what, what God has promised. Listen, his promises are sure. He has never failed on any promise that he's ever made. Live in what God has promised. Many a saint has run their race and is now enjoying the promises of heaven. As this world falls apart, one day it's going to be worth it. When well, we've enjoyed a lot, a, a, a good life, enjoyed some blessings, not worried about where our next meal's coming from, had a roof over our head, it's all going to be worth it just to see his face one of these days. He promised us. If you've never trusted him, there's no other, by, no other person to trust. He's Lord. He's the only true God. His name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Put your trust in him. You say, Brother Dean, this world's falling apart and I don't know who to trust. I'll tell you who to trust. Trust the one that's in charge of everything. You mean he's admit that mean to let it all happen? No, he's trying to get your attention. You saw it, now turn to him. Because that's what Je Jesus is controlling everything. And one day he's going to turn it all over to Satan in the tribulation period to let people know that it would completely fall apart without his word. If you've never trusted him, his name is Jesus Christ. It's not Buddha. It's not uh, Muhammad. It's not Islam. It's not a, a Baptist or a Methodist religion. His name is Jesus Christ. Trust him. If you'll say this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for being a sinner. Please forgive me. Lord, I now receive you into my heart. I know you died for me and you came back alive. Three days later, alive right now. Please come into my heart and life and save me. If you'll do that, the Bible says Jesus will save you. My friend, I trust that you know Jesus Christ. Don't, don't put a lot of faith in this world. This world's falling apart and it's going to continue to fall apart. Boy, if we just have our faith and trust in him. He that is in that throne room that will never be invaded by the enemy. He that rules and reigns forever by just the word of his mouth, compassion of his heart. Oh, what a great God that we have. Heavenly Father, I pray you take this thought this morning. And I pray, God, that you'd please help us all to turn to thee and look to thee and hope in thee and trust in thee. Lord, with all this is going on and many people that are hurting in their body, I pray, God, in your heart and spirit, I pray that you would give them. I pray that you would give them the hope of that promise that we one of these days we're all going to be out of this. Weeping may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. I pray, Lord, you bless. Till we get to meet again, keep us all safe. And as the Bible said in Genesis, the Lord watch between me and thee when we are apart from each other. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is Brother Dean from the Landmark Baptist Church Pulpit, and I trust that you'll join us again this evening for our other online service. Hey, let's make sure that we walk with God. Turn to Him. If you've got some things in your life, let's make sure that we get those things out of our life. If you've never been saved, you need Christ in your life. He's the one that rules and reigns. Ask Him to be your Savior today. Good afternoon. God bless you.